welcome back to Letterbox Book Club. Today we will be discussing um, A Court of Frost and Starlight, which is the fourth installment in the Akatar series, and it's also a short novella, so not as big as the others. Um, not as much story, but still just a nice little break from everything that happened in the last three. So I'll just start off with the blurb to just get us back into it. Feyre's first winter solstice as High Lady is drawing near. With it will come a hard-earned rest from work that she, Resand, and their friends have done to rebuild the Night Court and the vastly changed world beyond. Yet the festive atmosphere can't keep shadows from looming. Even as her own heart heals, she finds that those dearest to her have wounds that go deeper than she knew, and the scars of the past will touch her court in times to come. In other words, the Christmas special is what we like to call it. Yeah, the Hallmark Christmas special. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not yeah, not a lot of plot, but it's where like a lot of threads kind of come through. You think about what is potentially going to happen in the next few books. But yeah, it's a nice mm. little reprieve because yeah, I feel like a lot of other books they just like jump from story to story. There's no little, I suppose, depending on the genre and if it's definitely like a war type series, like there is kind of no rest within war. But as far as these guys are aware, the threat is relatively over for now. Also, especially if you're doing like a long series, like a large, like large books and a long series like it's hard to just keep going back into that world like same it's war over and over again yeah that's why i am low-key struggling with uh, a court of silver flames <laughs> but that's just uh. the, that's just the me just a me thing right now mm -hmm. but yeah and with this book we found that there's multiple multiple points of views which is quite different because um throughout the first three books it's really either between well um, minimally resand like very rarely we get a point of view from him but it's been mostly Feyre so it's mm. nice that um we get a bit of a idea of what everyone else is thinking and feeling throughout this book as well mm -hmm. it's a nice little experimental novella as you said mm. so we kick off back into the night court. Uh, small amount of repairs happening throughout the city. Feyre, you know, wakes up and she tries to talk to Reese through their their bond, which is and he he's not there because he is meeting with war allies and stuff, discussing, you know, political matters. Because now since the wall is still down, we know the spring court's kind of messed up and neglected. There's a lot of political interests and territory movements that we get to learn about throughout the book. Also, at the beginning of the book as well, um, we're reminded that it's been a year ago, really, since Feyre was meant to marry Tamlin. So she's having a bit of memories about that and then when Reese came to save her. Obviously, on top of all the war and what happened with her sisters and stuff, she's still got those memories and still reeling from that ordeal of her PTSD surrounding Tamlin. And she's never been given a kind of downtime to sort of work through it or go through it at all. Like, for her, it's been go, go, go. It's always it's been one thing after the other. She hasn't had time to kind of settle down, relax, think about yeah. what she's gone through, or try and find a solution. And I think, yeah, throughout this book is where she, she begins to step into that space of a sense of recovery for herself. Yeah. But yeah. And then the next little part is uh, Reese's point of view and we learn he is at an Illyrian war camp I think he's up at Windhaven yeah yeah um because there is still a bit of discontent amongst Illyrian war camps and Reese, being the high lord of the night court he has to sort of deal with the matters and deal with the generals running the camp there's a dispute between Cassian and a leader called an Illyrian leader called Devlon and it's in regards to having females learning to fight and train. We learnt throughout the first three books that the Illyrians, they're very they're a very backward society. Like they're they have strong like gender normities. So all the females are expected to like cook, clean, caretake, bear children, all that type of thing. But um Cassian Reese and Azriel, they're very strong believers in allowing female Illyrians to like fight and battle and fly. Sorry, they also tend to um, clip the female's wings so that they can't fly. Yeah. Which is um, very brutal. Very brutal and I guess an allegory for female um, genital mutilation as well, but that's a bit deep. Yeah, which I was thinking about the other night, like you have this fantasy world and yet you still want to kind of introduce those sort of gender normities is that really yeah. necessary and or gender gender brutalities and stuff yeah is that really necessary considering the world puts up with it like we know it happens in the world one way or another 
Yeah. I suppose no world can be too perfect. Like there has these things have to happen in order for conflict and resolutions and stuff, I guess. Yeah. But yes, Cassian uh, is wanting the females to train for two hours. Devlon has a very stubborn negotiator. He try he brings it down to ninety minutes and mm-hmm. um, very reluctant to have the males also help around with domestic duties like cleaning, cooking. But that's what they've managed to agree on. They also hear rumours as well that uh, there's people in the camp that believe that the Illyrian warriors were put in places on the war, um, in the war, on the front lines and stuff, that they were put in places where they would die in battle, like deliberately die. Sort of like cannon fodder. Yeah. But, like, you are trained to go to battle. You're not going to, like, win every time, I guess. Like, there is always that risk of dying. Like, with the Battle of the Wall 500 years ago, the they were all fighting that. And, like, I'm sure they weren't kind of whinging like that. Yeah, after that. Yeah, that yeah, really kind of weird way to add a bit of conflict. But, see, I must have missed o- whisked over that part a bit too quickly. Because I was like, why are they even upset? Mm. And now we're back in Valerius, we're fa- back to Feyre's point of view, and she is walking through the rainbow. Because winter solstice is approaching, pre- it's pretty much, yeah, they, they celebrate it kind of like how we celebrate Christmas. Yeah. And she is out searching for gifts for her friends and family. And now at this point she has been recognised as High Lady throughout the entire entirety of the Night Court. So every so everyone's like reaction to her has been very royal. Yeah. And just thank, like, people go up to her and thank her for what she did in the war. And that they all remember her saving a lot of them, and especially during the battle when Highburn infiltrated Valaris as well, when she saved the rainbow, well, she went to defend the rainbow. Yeah, and she's seeing, um, like, buildings, like, in repair because, yeah, the Night Court still got hit pretty hard. And then she meets a, a little side character called Sinner, Resinner. Yep. Well, she was looking at a house that has been kind of vacant, and um, yeah, this this person comes up to her and explains to her that the the family that lived in the house were able to escape, and that that family are also thankful for saving um, them throughout the war. Pharaoh is yeah, just kind of this is where her human side kind of still kicks in, um, you know, the caring for other people more so than herself. Yeah, and yeah, so she's pretty much also grieving. For the people of the Night Court, with for all the people that they've lost and the things that they've lost. Yeah, and Fair is debating because Rosina says that this like house that she comes across, like they, um, the family are selling it, and Fair is reluctant because she wouldn't want to like take it away from them. Mm. Um, and she said like she'll pay them for it and stuff, and she kind of needs her own space to deal with things, but she doesn't want it to be. Um, come to her by taking it away from someone else. That's right. She's contemplating, like, painting again and, like, having her own little space to do that. Yeah. And, yeah, she's really tossing up having this as her little private, I guess, studio, would you say? Yeah. Moving on, like, she runs into more and they're trying to find a gift for Amran. Apparently Amran is pretty easy to, to buy for. Like, she just likes her shiny jewellery things. Mm-hmm. Shiny trinkets. And they also visit... The Hewn City in the Night Court, which is where Kerr and that are, as they meet with them every year, just kind of, it's like that the that um the other side of the family, you know, you go visit, you know, in the afternoon, <laughs> it's either like the afternoon yeah. shift or the morning shift. So they go visit visit them. Um, we are surprised to see Eris there as well from the Autumn Court, chilling in the Court of Nightmares. This is where kind of the the gaining territory amongst the courts comes up because Eris actually says that um, the Autumn Court's intent is to gain more territory. And in order to do that, they have to go through the Spring Court, which is go through Tamlin, um, in order to get to the mortal lands because they can't really defend themselves now that the wall's gone. And any court that wants to grow into the Spring Court will have to ask Tamlin's permission um, but the trio is suspicious because Tamlin is going to want to gain more territory as well, or so they think. But he also hasn't, he's been kind of silent lately. So Reese decides to go and give a visit to Tamlin. Yes. So Reese goes to the Spring Court and finds that it is completely abandoned, pretty much apart from Tamlin. 
Hamlin's very much wallowing. He's not guarding his borders. He has no army to defend his borders because Pharaoh like turned them all against him. Reese offers to help him like send some men, but Tamlin refuses because he doesn't want to have brutes, aka the Illyrian warriors, on his land. Reese gets angry over this comment and then just lashes out at Tamlin, says that Tamlin has everything that has come to him, like it's all his fault and stuff. Um and it's kind of, I think it's mentioned as well by Lucian, like Reese shouldn't have kicked Tamlin while he was down, like he's already gained so much from him. Um, and I did I did feel bad for Tamlin in this scenario because yeah, he's got nothing left. Like, yeah, he brought it on himself, but it was just quite depressing to see what has come of him. Yeah, like absolutely having every single person kind of abandon him, you'd think he'd have like like it, even just like a handful of people that kind of like out of pity probably stick around but the fact that everybody abandoned him considering he technically say like by it going way back into the first book you know he found Feyre you know yeah. they, they were legitimately genuinely in love like he saved the spring court but yeah I guess I guess just because you, you did that it doesn't really justify your behavior moving forward yeah, and to get at this point as well, where because in the at the end of the last book, um, Wings and Ruin, um, like Tamlin just says to Pharaoh, like just be happy because when he brings Reese back to well, he helps bring Reese back to life, and Pharaoh says like I'll give you anything, and he just says be happy for Pharaoh. I was like, okay, like this is it. They've written Tamlin out, but he's come up now in this part as well, so it leads me to believe that there has to be some sort of redemption arc coming or like more to Tamlin's story so I'm very interested to see where that's going to go. Yes considering he was like the integral part in the first book of drawing just like a book audience in you know yeah very interesting for him to kind of become come to the bottom of the heap considering he was yeah so important and he was written in a way yeah. that made everybody who read the first book kind of love him and now he's just it's just yeah. kind of gone downhill from there. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of nice for Reese to kind of pop in and kind of, and keep up with him a little bit, try and... Like, I guess, yeah, Reese did go in with good intentions, but yeah, he's so um, loyal to his brothers, essentially, Cassian and Asriel, mm -hmm. that that, yeah, comment just threw him over the edge. So I can understand why he yeah. got angry. But... It also goes to show how much Reese cares about, like, the new the potential new treaty and like the territories itself like he probably doesn't want anybody to expand or yeah do yeah or do anything untoward towards the humans yeah um, but yeah this is definitely a point that um, makes you think if it's going to be the next kind of issues in the next few books yeah and then tamlin eventually tells reese to leave and then reese leaves um and then he he, he sees Feyre. he fills her in on everything that's happening in the spring court with Tamlin. He, and apparently he was really disappointed in his behaviour by, I guess, lashing out at Tamlin when he was offended by his brute's comment. But Feyre kind of reassures him that he's allowed to slip up in terms of his diplomacy. Yeah. Considering, yeah, all the vital threats are over, like, the, de the leading of Prithian moving forward is going to be, like, the hardest part and it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, so we move on from that kind of fast and it's more into the winter solstice stuff again. Um, and because Feyre's birthday is on winter solstice as well, Reese realises that he hasn't gotten Feyre a birthday present. So he goes out to find her something. It's good to know that she gets like double presents and it's not one of those situations where you pick one or the other. Yeah. Kind, <laughs> kind of like exactly on Christmas. I'm sure there are some Christmas kids out there who either got like one set of gifts instead of two. Yeah. Um, so Cassian arrives at the townhouse and he and Feyre get drunk and put up the decorations. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always a cute, it's cute, fun, fluffy moments to kind of yeah. pull us away from the war, the animosity, the grief. It's cute. Yes. So, um, yeah, and Feyre finds Elaine because Elaine's been working in the kitchen and stuff, like helping out, and Elaine, and Feyre asks Elaine if Nesta is coming, and Elaine just says that Nesta doesn't want to come to anything ever, and so once again, we are reminded of what a horrible, awful person Nesta is in these, these first few books and this novella. I want to bring up, real... kind of does a... 
I'm so sorry. I want to bring up real quick. So this is the girl who, you know, strong-willed against the glamour back in book one. Now she doesn't want to fight for anything. Yeah. She has one that one good little glimmer moment of hope where we think, oh, she actually cares about Pharaoh. She loves Pharaoh. She will do anything to kind of save her sister. Only to mm. be brought back around to this this sort of and behavior. Also, yeah, the moment in um at the end of Aka War as well, when Cassian is assumed to be about to be killed and Nesta throws herself over him as well because if they're going to die, they're going to die together. Mm. And then it is simply never addressed again. Yeah, like why does she have a couple moments of well wow, maybe we'll we'll kind of respect her that little bit more maybe this is kind of like a little character set of character development but no she just gets pulled back into her broody cold self which i get it kind of during akafas because she's kind of gone through so much you know she was you know forced into the cauldron yeah, and just made all dealing against with her their will. trauma yeah exactly so she's allowed to go off and brood and be snarky and she um, i guess the writer allows her gives her that time to kind of be that way and to fall into kind of dodgy behaviors but like pharaoh kind of was never allowed to do that she hasn't really had but, a moment but i guess it's not in yeah. pharaoh to kind of be self-destructive also that's fine but i don't like she's already written to just like disregard everyone except for herself and stuff i don't and because she's already written like that i don't understand why it then has to be reinforced so much so much with other interactions between characters about her and like how awful she is and how she doesn't want to do things or go anywhere and she's not talking to anyone it's like yes we get it she's an awful person you don't need to reinforce it because then when you come into the next book and you start doing a 180 on her it's very hard to uh I guess fall into that mind space of yeah she is actually a nice person Yes, and that's probably why I'm struggling so hard with Silver Flame because she's written to the point where I really do not like mm. her and I do not care about her whatsoever. And yeah, I understand. She I guess we'll talk about it. Sorry, I guess we'll talk about it more in Silver Flames. Yeah. But yeah, there's things that yeah, it's been four books of she's an awful person, blah blah blah. Oh wait, this is why, and it's like yeah, it explains why she does the things that she does. That's coming for you, Claire. Yeah. Um, but like it's. Again, with like the Tamlin thing, like it's you're reaching, you're reaching, you're reaching, and you're not quite landing on that redemption. Mm. And I'm, I'm just realizing now, like we learn later on, like she's a little bit kind of self destructive on herself, and we'll talk about that. But when back in the first book, when they were living in poverty, like she was, she never had those types of behavior, you know? Mm. So I just don't understand why it's a bit more extreme now. Maybe, I mean, yeah. to, I mean, to be fair, she did just like lose her father, but like. Yeah. She never really respected him. She hated him, but I suppose losing a parent, you know, it's it's always going to leave a mark regardless. But yeah, just like whereas yeah, they were literally living in poverty for like a a, a fair while and Pharaoh was the one looking after them and like she was never kind of self-destructive. She was snarky and like, you know, she relied on Pharaoh and like didn't really take on a more of a big sister role. But yeah. But she was never too self-destructive about it, which is kind of yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, it's just kind of weird to me yeah so um so chillin'. yeah <laughs> chillin'. <laughs> chillin with her men and her alcohol yes, yes anyway we're back to uh solstice back to the dinner elaine asks Amarin about her new body because Amarin gave up all her powers and stuff and she chose to remain in just her normal fade body without any powers elaine asks about it and then Amarin just simply says that elaine like you cannot return to being human no matter how much elaine wishes it gets a bit awkward as real defends elaine but then it gets kind of brushed over and the good mood continues it came across as a very yeah, insensitive type of question for Amarin. I just made a mistake as well. They're not at the winter solstice dinner yet. This is just like a family dinner that they're having. The winter solstice dinner is coming up soon. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, this is kind of like the uh, rehearsal rehearsal dinner, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> this is like the Christmas Eve like, yeah, get-together. Exactly. The, the chill one, yeah. <laughs> exactly. No one is fighting. Yeah. No one is crying. Everything is chill. Yeah, is everything's kind of chill. <laughs> But Feyre and Elaine do give each other their gifts early, I believe. Yeah. So after that dinner, um, Feyre and Reese find Nesta at, um, it's described, I think, as a seedy pub in Valara. So just, yeah, hole in the wall, sort of like gross, dingy bar, I guess, 
in our world that would be. Um, Feyre asks Nesta to spend the holiday with them and Nesta just flat out refuses and Feyre uses kind of harsh but says that their father would want them to be together. Nesta obviously gets upset and tells Feyre to leave. Um, and also at this point, Feyre and Reese are kind of bankrolling like everyone's life and so Nesta reminds Feyre that her like Nesta's rent is due and Feyre says that she'll make sure it's paid if Nesta comes to spend the solstice with them. Yeah, it's, yeah, that kind of little power. Because, like, again, I suppose to have a bit of sympathy towards Nesta, like, yeah, she was kind of turned Faye against her will. She's forced to leave the mortal lands at risk of being killed, and she's forced to, I guess, live in, yeah, this sort of situation that she never really wanted. I, now that I say that out loud, it's kind of understandable why she's a bit, you know, why she <laughs> is the way she is, and maybe I'm, I was being a little too harsh. I might do yeah, a 180 so myself. Yeah, so, like, I, at this point, like, I like Nesta again because I finished Silver Flames and stuff, and I kind of, like, understand what has happened, but it's still so hard to get through it, knowing that this is how she was written and reading it like this. Yeah, so, yeah, self-destructive in the way, yeah, she's drinking at city bars and messing around with many a men, many a fame men. Many a men, yes. Um, so anyway, the winter solstice arrives, so Christmas Day, if you will, um, and Feyre gets three presents from Reese, a sketchbook, a scarf, and a satchel for her art supplies, um, and we find out about a tradition that Reese, Azrian, and Cassian have, and so they all leave to go and take part in their tradition, which I believe is them having a snowball fight. Because they are big Illyrian children. <laughs> yes. Big babies. <laughs> yeah, because, like, they talk about, like, in passing throughout the book, oh, it's their tradition to go away for a day and do, like, a, whatever the boys do. And, like, it, it kind of got built up to be this kind of, like, ooh, I wonder what it is, some sort of sacred type of ritual. But, nah, it's just a just a snowball fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hunt, like, and they and they tally. They tally it. I think Azriel had it. Cassie, they've all had a good yeah. amount of wins. But, oh, well, boys will be boys. This is what we mean when we say boys will be boys. Just having a random snowball yeah. fight on Christmas Day. <laughs> yes. But yeah, more pretty much takes uh, Feyre to show her what, what, they, what they're doing. And it's pretty cute. It's a cute yeah. wholehearted scene because, yeah, like these, like, Asriel, the, the silent, broody shadow singer. We don't know much about him. Then there's Cassian, the war general, and Reese the high lord. Like, big personalities, strong ideas, and they're just, like, going ham at each other with snowballs. It's just... It's just a funny sight and a funny yeah. thought. Nice and lighthearted. Yeah. Um, so back in Valaris, Lucian has turned up at Townhouse. Mm -hmm. um, and it's awkward between him and Aileen because of course it is. Um, and Feyre asks Lucian to come and live with them because then he'll be close to Elaine and they can spend time together and such. But Lucian refuses because he explains that he has been disowned twice now, once by his own family and once by Tamlin and the Spring Court. And Tamlin has had an argument, like that argument with Reese. So Tamlin has decided that he will be spending solstice alone. So Lucian decides that he should go and be with Tamlin. How do you feel about that? Beat strong. <laughs> yeah, poor Lucian, um, being bounced around between everybody. Yeah, I get it, because yeah, even if like I, yeah, had kind of had a fight with my friend or whatever, I guess, I'm like, I still wouldn't want them to be alone mm. on Christmas. But again, it's keeping Tamlin in the story, so it, like, I just, I'm holding on to hope that there's something good coming. Yeah. Because otherwise, like, stop doing this. <laughs> <laughs> it's either just let him go off and we don't have to worry about him again, or let yeah. there be some sort of closure, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Elaine is not as completely disgusted to see Lucian, we find throughout this book. Like, she kind of, she doesn't really, like, want him as a mate at this point, because she's still kind of heartbroken over the whole Grayson situation. Yeah. But she's willing to kind of, like, sit with him and talk to him, kind of, yeah, get to know him. But yeah, and he gives them both a gift, I believe, as well. I'm not, I forget what it was. He gives Elaine um, gloves that, like, don't get sweaty or whatever for her gardening. Oh, oh but that's sweet. That's sweet. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember what he gives Feyre, but he gives her something. Else. Yeah. And I don't know if it's now or a little later on, but we learn that he is joining, living with Jurian and Vessa, and they have, like, a little band of exiles. Exiles they've named themselves. Yeah, because they don't quite, their situations have brought them to a point where they don't really belong anywhere other than kind of with each other because they're all in the same boat yeah um which is nice to hear that like 
hear Vessa again because her situation while being kind of imprisoned with the the sorcerer lord um I really hope that they get like free her and solve her in the next set of books because you know she's done a lot for them yeah definitely and just that curse or or enchantment is just so brutal Durian I don't really care about (laughs) Um, I like him. <laughs> I, I, I did, yeah, I like him, but I don't, I don't really care about him. Like he's had his purpose throughout the the first three books. Now he can kind of retire away. Like I don't care if we don't really see him again. He might pop up every yeah. now and again, sure. Um, yeah. but yeah, I think he he's run run its run his course is what I'm, I guess I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Now that we know that, like Miriam and Dracon are Dracon. alive. <laughs> And, like, he doesn't care about his revenge anymore. So I suppose there's not much left for him to carry on. Yeah, definitely. So back at Solstice, um, like, the snowball fight's over. They've done their thing. Back at dinner, um, well, before dinner, they're doing birthday celebrations for Feyre and they're exchanging gifts. And in the middle of exchanging gifts, Nesta shows up. Mm-hmm. Because she really wants that check. That rent money. She needs her rent money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they just exchange gifts. Nothing really much happens. Um, except that Nesta gets up to leave. Um, and before she leaves, Feyre offers her the check for her rent money, and Feyre hopes that Nesta will not accept it. Um, but she does and she leaves and Cassian goes after her. I just wanna be go back to when we were talking about the seedy bar. Word would have spread that Nesta killed the King of Highburn, so why isn't she like treated as a hero? Yeah, I think because of her general attitude. I know, but like it'd still be a bit more. I know she's not really appreciative of it. From the townsfolk around her, like there'd be a, a little bit, little bit of respect. A little bit. I think they do, but I think, yeah, because she gives off such like a bad attitude and stuff. Mm, it's, it's, it's not that there. deserving, really. Yeah. Kind of like, a, oh, you killed the King of Highburn. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. But yeah, and yet Cassian goes after her. I want, I'm going to reiterate, I think I may have mentioned this in the previous book. I do not remember a time where Nesta and Cassian had, like, the slow friendship build-up. It's just been straight. They've gone straight into pairing. And I just find that their rela- relationship dynamic a bit awkward. Because, yeah, anytime Nesta... I think there's been, like, just, yeah, little bits here and there. Yeah. And, yeah, Cassian is always, like, the first one to wind her up and everything, but it's, like, you never, you just kind of, I feel like you just got thrown together to be paired off, but that's just me. (laughs) And I suppose I'll find out in other books whether or not it's going to be true or not, so. We shall see. Cassian, I guess, in that respect, being Cassian, insists on walking Nesta home. And, of course, they're arguing and bickering away at each other, mainly, yeah, because of Nesta's attitude and her current feelings towards Feyre, I guess, with the trauma of losing her father. Cassian, we re- learned that it was trying to find her a nice gift, which is quite nice. Because even though she doesn't really want to be there, everyone it'd be kind of rude to not ha- ha- get everyone to have a gift. Kind of like that late arrival, but still get something. Yeah. It's always quite nice. But they argue, so he throws it into the river. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tr- yeah. <sighs> which, I guess... <laughs> Take, yeah, taking that back because she doesn't deserve her present, I guess. <laughs> I forget what it was, or unless she said what it was. I'm not sure. It must have been that important. But anyway, yeah, Nesta tells Cassian to go home and he starts to, like, fly and, like, follow her home just to make sure she gets home safe, which is quite nice. Yeah. Nesta gets home safe, Cassian leaves, and then Nesta just kind of chills in her own space and lights a fire, but, like, the, the snap, the crackling of the fire reminds her of the snapping of her father's neck um and she's fallen into that bit of grief once more even though she like hated her father during their impoverished years never really tried to provide um she had that that resentment will always hold but again losing a parent you know leaves that that little mark regardless of your relationship I, i think and even like just throughout the book in general pharaoh is still contemplating or even trying to paint there was a little scene where she kind of breaks in to that house that she was um, sussing out and she spends a bit of time in there painting. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, and she starts really thinking about maybe I can buy the space. So I'm pretty sure we still haven't found out all of Reese's gifts for Feyre. So one of the gifts that Feyre gave to Reese was that she, through their bond, like Feyre sent the image of their son that the bone carver had shown them. So she's basically saying, Daddy, put a baby in me, please. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And he's like, hell yes. And so then the next morning, 
Here we find out that Reese has bought a rundown estate for them and Vera can design it however she wants and it's a big house and it has room for a baby. Yeah, it's, that's cute. I just remembered uh, Vera and Rusana, they, there was like a little painting workshop that Rusana invited Vera to and she throughout, oh, yeah. throughout the book was tossing up whether or not to go um, and then she, she wanted to go but then she changed her mind because she really did not want want to paint I guess and I think that's when she's thinking about buying that place that she was looking at because as a space for like a communal space I believe or did she not end up buying that place at all that's where they did the art workshop oh okay so she did buy it for the art workshop purpose okay cool but yeah anyway yeah back to back to that Reese's gift Oh yeah, sorry. Um, also, while they're up at the cabin, um, that Reese has wished her away to, to have some alone time together. To make that baby. Um, to make the baby. Um, Feyre asks Reese if he would change the tattoo on her hand to be the Night Court logo, which is the same as Reese's. Um, and Reese says that if the change is made, that Feyre will be a member of the Night Court forever. And Feyre accepts that. That's what she wants. So Reese changes her tattoo. Marriage mate. And I think this is like the final, <laughs> the yeah, final step, bargain. like the final, the more et eternal thing. Nah, that's really cool. It's cool that they're able to change the tattoo like that, but I suppose it's a once-off. Yeah. Which is really cute. They can have matching tattoos together. By the end of the book, we see Reese's point of view and he arrives at the spring court to find Tamlin just kind of just chilling about in his very neglected manner, completely deserted. And he has a dead kind of creature, I think an elk. On the front table and he's not even trying to like eat it or cut into it or anything like that and then Tamlin he hasn't tried to prepare it to be like appropriate for eating yeah no nah, he is just so out of it which which is quite interesting to see again his kind of behavior though very deserved it's a shame that everyone just kind of left him i mean th yeah. i mean thank you fair up i guess <laughs> <laughs> um and then Tamlin starts to get a little deep a little Seensy weensy bit open kind of with with Reese. Like he asks if um Pharaoh will kind of ever forgive him um for anything any of this and then like obviously Reese isn't Pharaoh so he, and he doesn't speak for her so he doesn't know what the answer to that question will be. And coming back to your point, like will he be trying to seek Pharaoh's forgiveness at all? Like is this what's going to be stringing him along that little bit longer? Mm. And then Reese, kind of being a smartass, points out that Tamlin has never really apologised for any of his kind of his abusive, controlling behaviour. Yeah. So Tamlin explains that it probably wouldn't have made a, dif made a difference, but like it would have. Yeah. <laughs> Acknowledging it, apologising, and be opening to to change. Yeah, even if she doesn't accept it, yeah, just acknowledge your behaviour and take responsibility for yeah. it. Like, and yeah, you can say. Oh, like it's all Feyre's fault because she turned the spring court against him and stuff. But then you have to think why she did that. Like Tamlin has to be like, well, why? Why did she think she had to do that? You, you re it really backs well, backlogs to the point where he kept her in the manor and yeah, really took up. away her liberties and sovereignty almost. Yeah. But yeah, or well, he he needs to go to the Fey equivalent of therapy. You know, is there like a <laughs> a therapy court out there somewhere. And then Reese, just as a, like a, a good gesture, he manages to magically prepare the elk and the food sliced for Tamlin to eat, and then he leaves the spring court. And that's and that's kind of where it ends. It ends on that little slightly uplifting moment. Thoughts, feelings, emotions? Uh, when I first read this, I read it online, and I think it's only like 200 pages or something, and I finished it, and I was just like, wait, what? That's it? Because I didn't know that it was a novella. And I think if she had made, uh, Akatar slightly longer, and maybe put like the first, first few chapters of like, Mist and Fury in, at the end of Akatar and left it on a cliffhanger of Reese coming to claim the bargain, and then made the other two like slightly shorter, she could have fit this into the third one you think so yeah and i think because now that i know the way that's meant to be laid out like it's going to be uh one two three this novella and then one two three and another novella i was like oh like this is a break because it's going into different people's storylines and stuff but also like yeah it just seemed a little bit unnecessary 
they talk about the trauma and stuff, but nothing in regards to that has yeah. been solved. And it's... also, again, like, it paints Nesta in such a negative light to be like, well, this is the book before the Nesta book. Like, why would you put it in such a, put her in such a negative light when you're going to then convince us in the next one that, oh, actually, she's not that bad? I mean, yeah, just anyone could, like, find A Court of Silver Flames and read the, the, the blurb, and it, it's just, it's really, like, the Nesta story now. I don't know if even Sarah J Mass posted it, but it, it was like a, a, a web page that had the initial structure, yeah, of all the books. Yeah, the first three books centered like its own like little trilogy. This is the kind of interlude, and then Silver Flames onwards is like another sort of trilogy. Yeah. Um, and that's what I was saying to you a little while ago. Um, yeah, if Akatar ended with Wings and Ruin, that would have been like a signed seal delivered trilogy on its own, right there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's a cute interlude. Nothing got really solved in terms of yet yeah, trauma other than learning the self-destructive behaviour of both Tamlin and Nesta. Tamlin more deserving than Nesta. Mm. We learned potential plot threads with the Illyrian war camps, all their little discontent about the the war tactics. And I hope again, I keep saying like, yeah, I hope Vessa is released. Uh moving forward because yeah. It it just seems like the right place to go. Otherwise, why have her still hang around as well? Yeah. But I suppose fan book lover the book lovers fall in love with these side characters like Cassian and Azriel and like Vessa and maybe and like you who like Durian very much now. Um like yeah. obviously we want to know more about them, but keep them hanging around, but I reckon have it a bit more meaningful. But yeah, that cute Christmas special. I, I quite enjoyed it. It was a very quick read in comparison to the yeah. others. I enjoyed it, yeah, it's like a sort of reprieve. Yeah. But yeah, just I found it slightly unnecessary. Mm. Especially, like, I don't want to, yeah, discuss too much here, but especially when, uh, after the way that the next book goes. Mm. I don't understand. There was also, a uh, flicking, because I currently am holding a physical copy of Akafas, which is Kenzie's, um, I forget that <laughs> Moore, Morrigan goes to, go has a point of view, and she goes to the Winter Court, or she was going to the Winter Court. I forget yeah. why, it's not really that important, but it's more just, like, a more thing. We we get sucked into her little mindset of what's going on with her. Yeah. But no, it's good that we got a bit of everybody. They're pretty much, they covered, like, a, most of the Night Court crew, you know, you had Reese point of view, Pharaoh point of view, Morrigan point of view, Cassian point of view. You could have put, like, Asriel's point of view in there, and maybe even Elaine's. But I, I suppose Elaine, it's rumoured. She's getting another, she's getting a point of view Yeah, book. there's an Elaine book coming. And just by reading the blurb, <clears throat> as well of Silver Flames, Cassian is going to have a more significant role in that book. And from yeah. what I've read up to, he's had a pretty significant role. I'm just trying to find out if we know anything about the next book. Like, confirm. I think there's a rumour that there's going to be an Azriel one too. It could either be like Azriel or Elaine. Yeah, the most obvious choice for the character at the centre of the next book would seem to be Elaine. But as you said, it would just be 600 pages of her being like, I love gardening. <laughs> I love gardening. I don't know how to garden vegetables, though. I just find, I think I just found it annoying that, like, Feyre was never allowed to kind of fall into the, a destruct, self-destructive pattern. She wasn't allowed to brood. She wasn't allowed to be snarky at people, but I guess that's yeah. just the element of her character. She's never even, like, really lashed out at anyone due to her trauma and stress, but Nesta is just mm. allowed to be that the frustrating person that we have to read through. I I'm coming across as a really bad N Nesta hater, but, like, ugh. I mean, in the first book, she, it was described that she would purposefully move her father's cane out of reach. Like, that just tells me all I need to know about her as a person. Yeah, exactly. Forcibly, through the sibling hierarchy, managed to, well, I suppose, well, she never really stepped up, but, like, yeah, forcing the rest of the responsibility onto Feyre, though it would have been inadvertently. Yeah. But, yeah, the fact that she was never drinking, I suppose you have to be rich to, in order to drink a lot. And, like, she wasn't known for her promiscuous behaviour in the first book, so I don't understand how she could fall for it that quickly. Mm. But, you know, I, I hope she gets her act together. I hope... I'd learn to like her a little bit more, or at least respect her a little more. But other than that, I guess that's us done just having a chat about A Court of Frost and Starlight. Yeah, we hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah, I hope you have some ideas, similar ideas, differing ideas. It's Yeah, it's a short little read, but it's good. So join us next time for A Court of Silver Flames, and we'll let's see if I end up finishing it. 
<laughs> yeah, a book with many different uh, opinions surrounding it. <laughs> and theories. Theories, theories, theories. Yeah, theories galore. Theories galore. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Peace out.